Same one? It doesn't matter. After a while, they all seem the same. He should be here soon. Wonderful. Well, I take it you don't approve. You know I don't. But since when has that made a difference? Stop pouting. Malcolm, why are you meeting with him? Do you remember the first time you made love? What? Do you remember the first time you made love? Yeah, why? sort of. Well, why'd you do it? What do you mean, why did I do it? Was it planned? Was there a reason behind it? Or did it just happen because it was meant to? Uh, because you knew sooner or later you would. Because it was time. It was mostly because the woman said I could. <laughs> Rashad, there is nothing romantic about you. If you weren't my bodyguard, I'd think you'd be alone. <laughs> well, you share with me most of the time I am. Now I'm going to tell you about the time I met Billy Holiday. Yeah, okay, Malcolm. She sang a song for me. Did I tell you about that? She sang a song for you. Then Louis Armstrong asked you to play trumpet. No, Rashad, I'm serious. She sang it for me. She walked straight up to me, took the flower from my hair, gave it to me, and then she sang. You don't know what love is. Until you learn the meaning of the blues Until you love the love you've had to lose You don't know what love is You don't, you don't know, know how hearts yearn, yearn For a love that cannot live yet never, never dies. dies Until you face each dawn with sleepless eyes You don't know what love is mm -hmm. Hi, it's me. Are you okay? And the children? They always could sleep the morning, baby. And just like your mama. Betty. I'm sorry I'm not there for you. You know that, don't you? Next week at the Autobahn, I want you there with me. I want the whole family there. Then we'll spend more time together. I promise. Don't get so excited, girl. We got enough children. I gotta go. He'll be here soon. Betty? I love you. Kiss my little girls for me. And if you've been good, give yourself a big hug. Is the FBI still listening? I'm hungry. <laughs> well, send us some Chinese food and red soda. Oh, and hold the pork. <laughs> Is everything all right? The children are asleep. Sister Betty? Our house is bombed this morning, and I'm here. I haven't given her much. How about Rashad? Do you think she would ever feel that? She'd never be that selfish. But I know. I can hear it in her voice. The fear, mostly. For me and the family. I should be with her tonight. I should be with my children as often as possible. They should remember their daddy. The world will remember their daddy. They won't remember me, I know that. If I could just be sure that what I represent will be remembered, that's all that's important to me. And this country will try to do what it can to see that that doesn't happen. This country has always tried its best to eliminate the black man. It ain't happened yet. What could be changed doesn't have to be eliminated. 
I'm tired, Rashad. Seems like I've been a lot of things lately, but whatever else I've been, tired has been in there somewhere. I'm stuffy in here. Don't stay away from the window, Malcolm, please. All the forces in this country couldn't protect their own president. You think it makes a difference whether or not I can breathe the hard America? It may make a difference tonight. Those used to be my streets, Rashad. They'll always be your streets. They'll just never be safe. We're in the highest building in Harlem. How high up do I have to be before I finally feel safe? Just give the word, Malcolm, and we can strike back. Strike back? Do you think I trained them in the art of self-defense so they could defend themselves from us? Did you train them to throw a firebomb through your house? I don't think it was there. Oh, Malcolm. Well, no, Rashad, it just doesn't make any sense. Elijah doesn't have the power to do some of the things that have been happening recently. Oh, it's gone way beyond that. But Sunday at the rally, I'm going to say some things. Some things that are probably going to turn the heat up on us. I'm going to say I don't think it was the Muslims. And who are you going to accuse? Well, who else could it be? You think Elijah could get the French government to ban me from traveling in France? You won't ever get the initials out of your mouth. I'll just have to remember to talk fast. We can't afford to lose you. When I can't go to that window, you already have. Won't you at least cut back on some of the speaking engagements? There's no way we can manage large crowds anymore. Not when we have to watch out for people who look like us. There ain't nobody out on those streets that look like you. You gotta go clean across the ocean to another land to find somebody as ugly as you. <laughs> Either that or all the way downtown. <laughs> Please be serious, Malcolm. After the Audubon, I'll cut back. Anyway, I told Betty I'd spend more time with her. It's the first time I've heard her laugh in months. <laughs> you wanna play some chess? No. Why not? Because I always beat you. Have I become that predictable? <sighs> you play as if the object of the game is to protect the pawns, Malcolm. The pawns are there to protect the king. Well, perhaps it's time someone protected the pawns for a change. Then the game wouldn't be chess anymore. It'd be something else, something nobody would play. Would that be so bad? It's not a question of good or bad. It's a question of winning or dying. You can't sacrifice your people and expect to win. Look at that boy, Rashad. Tell me what you see. I see a game, Malcolm. A game we didn't invent. Look, you don't like the rules. Fine. Neither do I. But the only chance we got is to protect the leader. Once the leader gets too far in front, it's open season. Malcolm, even the pawns will help to sacrifice you. As long as this one piece is free and protected, the game ain't over. Whatever else you say or do won't change that. As long as this one piece has a chance, we all do. Rashad, we're all pawns. And as soon as we realize that, perhaps the old game can end and the new game can begin. Malcolm, go home. Be with Betty. Be with your children. You don't need to do this. We've got enough problems with having people thinking you betrayed Elijah and the other half thing you're getting soft. All this talk about white folks not being so bad. Now you mean with the king of love. It ain't right, Malcolm. I can feel it. Nothing good can come from this. Something good already has. What? I asked him to come and he said he would. And he never asked why. How do you know he's really coming? Malcolm, what makes you think that his people will just let him get on a plane and come here? He'll come. How do you know? Because I'd come if he called me. <laughs> do you trust him? No, do you trust me? I don't know that I trust anyone anymore. I'd die for you. And people who would die for me, I trust least of all. I didn't mean that, Rashad. I guess I haven't shaken that nightmare yet. At least it'll be over soon. Why will it be over? Malcolm.
Don't you think you should let him in? You know what I think. Minister? Dr. King! Oh, Rashad, you can leave Dr. King and I alone. We'll be all right. I need to check Dr. King. Uh, checked? I was already checked once downstairs. <laughs> Not by me. Rashad, somehow I don't think that'll be necessary. I'll be safe here with Dr. King. I'm sure you'd be safe with Dr. King, too. But how do I know that's really him? Well, perhaps you'd like a short speech or maybe an appropriate service. No, <laughs> no don't do that, Doctor. We'll be all right, Rashad. Very well, if you say so. May I take your coat, Doctor? Yes, thank you. I'll be just outside if you need me. Sorry about that. These are troubled times. I understand. I imagine the bombing has unsettled everyone. Well, it didn't do much for the price of real estate in my neighborhood. Did anyone see you come in? No, I followed your instructions. The next time you want me to take the back stairs, I wish you could get a room on the floor lower than the seven. <laughs> I've seen you on TV. You could afford to lose a few pounds. Television makes you look heavier. And anyway, this stomach's in the finest sense of Southern tradition and the ministry. The congregation don't warm up to damn preachers means preachers not good enough for you to get sweet potato pies in lieu of other donations. Well, my congregation sells pies street to street. You might say it keeps them thin and the donations fat. Speaking of pie, is that your lunch in that bag or perhaps a tape recorder? And why would I need a tape recorder? Maybe you're nervous about coming out of hotel rooms. Mr. Hoover does have a way of making people paranoid. I never thought the Lord could have made a mistake, but Hoover does push one's faith beyond reasonable limits. Have a seat, bro. Don't you want the couch? No, this will do fine. Oh, I forgot you used to those sit-ins and such. Well, I just find these are generally better for your back. But not your head, as I can recall. And I'm surprised you still have one with all that non-violent action you've been involved in. You'll be amazed what you can take when your purpose is clear. Perhaps. But I think some people just have naturally hard heads. For example, when you pass the uh, front of the hotel, did you notice a woman standing outside? She had on a short red dress and heavy makeup. The prostitute? Oh, would you guess she is? 30, 35. <laughs> She's 17, Reverend. But after three years on the street, age has no real significance. <coughs> She's part of a larger congregation, but you won't find them in your churches. They curse your God if they were alive enough to curse. But they're dead, Reverend. They're the living dead. And they exist simply because they're accustomed to it. And they haven't thought about why they should. If it weren't for the fact that they move around so often and not stay in one place too long, someone would have swept them away by now. I take it there's a point to all of this? I know something about the living dead. Young women working the streets and their pimps. If you're around the same people every day, you don't notice a change right away. But then all of a sudden you're aware that someone is old, or fat, without hope. The hopeless is what I'm here to show you, Martin, and to let you know that their number is growing every day. And do you have a solution? Unity. <clears throat> I've never been against that. Your unity is sitting around the campfire while the cross is burning, singing, We shall overcome. If you really believed in unity, 
you were saying, we shall come over. Every time there's an injustice, we shall come over. Every time a black woman is frightened by a white face behind a white hood, we shall come over. Every time and any time there's a need to stop white people from persecuting black people, we shall come over and we will stay till black people feel safe again. We also say, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. It doesn't matter what the song was. Nobody ever wanted their freedom singing. Now, on the other hand, if you want to do some swinging, violence, revenge, is that the unity that you seek? I seek to survive, Martin. I care about the quality of that survival. No, I don't seek violence. I seek to stop it by any means necessary. Violence never stops violence, Malcolm. And marches do. All those folks gathered singing. What did that get you? Some legislation? Yes. Birmingham gave us the Civil Rights Bill. Selma is going to bring us the voters' rights legislation. Every time we can expose hatred to the world, we come that much closer to making this country live up to what it says on the paper. Did that legislation help those civil rights workers murdered in the South or those children bombed in their own church? You got nothing, Martin, nothing but some empty promises and a piece of paper that betrays a lie and yet another long list of lies. The great American lie, the grand white lie. You know, I had a dream tonight. Oh. I'm sorry, that's your line. You may borrow it if you choose. This dream I had, we've been dead for some time. Long enough for the average American to be miseducated. Young black men and women didn't know who we were. They knew nothing of the movement, the struggle. It was as if it never happened. I woke up in a cold sweat, shaking and confused. I've seen my death countless nights, Martin, but that vision was never as frightening as this dream. We will be sold out, you and I. It might be over the promise of a job or to be supported as a new leader. It could happen any number of ways, but it will happen. You may even do it to yourself. And how do you think I'll accomplish my own undermining? We will match your capacity to inflict suffering with our capacity to endure it. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will. Threaten our children and we will still love you. Come into our homes in the midnight hour of life and take us out on some desolate highway and beat us and leave us there. And we will still love you. Say to us we aren't worthy of integration and we are too immoral, too low, too degraded. And we will still love you. Bomb our homes. Come to our churches early in the morning and bomb them if you please, and we will still love you. We will wear you down with our capacity to suffer. Did you say that, Martin? You know I said it, and furthermore, you know the context. The context? The context has got to be insanity. Is love insane? No, but we aren't talking about love. Then maybe you need to read it again. I try not to inflict suffering on myself more than once. Perhaps my capacity for that isn't as great as yours. You are not before the cameras now, Malcolm. You have an audience of one, and I am not cheering for you. So you can stop with the sarcasm and flippant remarks. I don't need any cameras, and I don't want the audience. I did not come into the debate, so you can stop the contest. The contest is more than a debate, Doctor. I wish it were that easy, Doctor. Why is it that every time you say the words doctor or 
reverend. I get the distinct impression that I should feel insulted. Perhaps it's my street accent. Not having had the advantage of university training, my words can sometimes seem too harsh. Oh, no, you're being modest, Malcolm. It is doubtful that Harvard invites someone to lecture who has difficulty being understood. They didn't have me there to lecture. They brought me there to be embarrassed. But then, I don't embarrass easily. And since Harvard didn't have anything I wanted, I saw no reason to apologize for not having it. Of course, they did have an ample number of Negroes there with an abundance of apologies all saved up for just such an occasion. And you see me as one of those types of Negroes? No. But I see you being used by white folks, whether you intended to be or not. That's why they'll erect monuments to you before you're through. Oh, I don't know, Malcolm. It seems to me a mention of your name is likely to cause a great deal of attention. Why, they may even name whole cities after you. You got the award, Martin. Yes, on behalf of all of us, for people everywhere who fought against injustice. White people gave you the award, Martin. Doesn't that worry you just a little that the people that are doing most of the oppressing or giving out all the awards? I bet you impressed them most when you say, if blood must flow on the streets, let it be ours. Hell, I bet every crack in the South chipped in to buy you an award for that one. The award was for peace, Malcolm. No, Doctor. The award was for being beaten and not fighting back. I did not expect acceptance from you, but understanding would be sufficient. <clears throat> You want me to understand how a black man could ask his people to be the first, last, and only ones to bleed, to give their precious blood to be spilled on the pavement of these cities and soaked into the soil of this nation? You want me to understand that? Did it ever occur to you that perhaps you are more responsible than I for the blood of our people flowing, that your speeches are unwittingly causing violence? No, not once, not ever. Aggression in the name of self-defense is not violence, it's honor. We have to think for ourselves, do for ourselves, not let the man shape our values, because he's got some tricky logic. He'll have you thinking defending your family is wrong, that defending your community is violence. If the music is a tango, you tango, simple as that. If you don't want me to tango, stop playing the music. Then maybe we can waltz, nice and polite like it. White gloves and black ties. Don't you think we've made any progress, Malcolm? Progress? Martin, you had some concessions thrown your way because I was the alternative. They threw some money, some legislation, and some cracker control programs your way in hopes that nonviolence would win out. Except we were the only ones being nonviolent. If they kill me first, you won't have anything to negotiate. And if they kill you, they can't let me live. They'll make you a martyr, Martin. They'll hold up your non-violent method as a testament to your courage. And if they hold it up long enough, people won't notice the contradiction that you were killed preaching. We can't learn anything from martyrs anymore, Martin. Jesus was a martyr. 2,000 years ago, you could die and not kill a movement. But today, it's brought you in living color. On big sides and small with one clear, unrelenting message. When you lead, you die. When you lead, you die. How long are we going to continue teaching that to our children? I have no martyr complex, Malcolm. I want to live a long life. I want to see my children grow up. I want to do all the things that a father is supposed to do. Don't face a spiritual death. So that this country is forced to face its own injustice, then I'll do that. Jesus gave this move from the spirit 2,000 years ago. Gandhi gave it a method. Today, black people in this country will forge that spirit together with that method and they'll create a weapon of love. We will live as brothers, Malcolm, or we most certainly will perish as fools. The 
This ain't the country, Reverend. They stacking families on top of families out here. Black man on top of black man. Till there's no room, till you can't breathe. And when you can't breathe, you die. Or you lash out and somebody else dies. And then the women. It could be a curse to be young and attractive out here on these streets. And then Martin, there's the drugs. You pump enough of those out, and they'll dream anything. They'll even believe your dreams. I can't change, Malcolm. I think you know that. Anybody can change. That girl on the street three years ago, she was 14 I years old. I can't change, Malcolm. And neither can you. Well, if you can't change, can you at least get angry? I remember the first march I ever led. I was surrounded by all kinds of people. Old women who barely had the strength to walk across the room somehow found the strength to march for miles. Young men and women were carrying their children. Older children were holding the hands of their younger brothers and sisters. All of a sudden, a bottle was thrown from the middle of a crowd of whites. We yelled duck and the adults did for children. See, children have a need to know what's being done. The bottle struck this young child, cut the entire left side of her face. We didn't have time to be angry then. We had to rush to protect her, to console her, to try and stop the bleeding, but we marched on. Sometime later we came across this Huge white man had to be bigger than the truck he must have been driving. He yelled out with all of his force, Go home, you little nigger bastard! He was speaking to a young child, no older than seven or eight. I saw the look on the child's face and he was hurt and afraid, but most of all, he felt ashamed. He felt he had to have done something so terribly wrong to have that much hate directed towards him. Yes, Malcolm, I can get angry. With all the history that makes me a black man, I can get angry, but it's a different kind of anger. It's an anger that lets you know that you cannot stop loving. You cannot stop believing. It's an anger that makes you want to prove hate wrong. I just want to prove hate less powerful. Oh, we both deal in power, Malcolm. We just do it differently. <laughs> yes, Reverend. You see our children bleeding and in tears, and you seek to comfort them. I see the man holding the rock in his hand, and I seek to stop it. And if I can't stop him from throwing it, I see to it that he never throws another. And what would that accomplish? You stop him, and there'll just be another, and another, and another. Martin, when the Russians brought missiles into Cuba, Kennedy didn't tell people to turn the other cheek and pray. He didn't try to fight the Russians with love, no. He got himself some bigger missiles, and he told them to pack up and get out. He was prepared to use force to defend this country. And this country expected him to do that. And another thing, Martin, the Russians respected him, and that's why they left. And missiles are being built all over the world. Do any of us really feel protected? You can't see the contradiction, can you? Even when you marched, you needed the protection of the federal government. It took the entire National Guard to enroll one Negro in college. What do you think all those tanks were there for? Help the students with their books. <clears throat> those tanks were there because this movement needed to hold a mirror in front of this country and through our pain, reveal its injustice. It's baseball, you get yourself a bat. And if you've got trouble swinging, you ought to stay out the game. I somehow had hoped your trip to Mecca would have given you a greater vision than that, perhaps even a broader compassion. You don't tame the lion and leave the jungle unchanged, Martin. I saw some things outside of this country, outside of this country, some things perhaps my heart wouldn't or couldn't let me see before. I saw whites who, when they spoke of color, made it sound incidental as if they were describing a 
suit or a sunset. But here, here it's different. When you hear the man here speak about color, you know what he means. You can hear it in his voice. You can see it in his expression. He means he's on top and you're not. And he's not going to let anything change that. The simple question of power and privilege. And those that are in power always decide the privilege. We are in power, Martin. And we won't be until we gain control of our own lives, our own thinking. You want to free black people, Malcolm. I want to free America. That is the only way any of us will truly be free. Can't you see what's happening to us? Five years from now, 10 at the most, white people won't have to do anything to us. We'll be doing it to ourselves. Those brothers who sit peacefully at their demonstrations and have their heads split open, do you know they go back to their communities and commit acts of violence? It's the rage, Martin. It's the hurt all balled up inside to you. Strike out the only way you can. The only way that's acceptable. I can't free us from that rage. But maybe I can try and direct it to the right source. Don't we really want the same things, Malcolm? You want to be able to buy a cup of coffee. I want us to be able to sell it. You want to integrate them coffee shop. I want us to own it. You want white folks to hire us. I want us to be able to hire ourselves. No, doctor. We do not want the same thing. I'm afraid your quest for integration will be the white man's solution for control. Maybe our only hope is that they will hate us so much they won't recognize the power they would have over us. They just let us in. So those of us that don't agree with your definition of power and control, I suppose we have to be called Uncle Tom's. <laughs> I call the older ones uncle. Now I don't use Tom anymore. I say Roy or Ralph or Uncle Whitney. They don't deserve that from you, Malcolm. <laughs> they don't deserve that from anybody. Do you really think this unity that you seek to be accomplished by insult and ridicule? Have I ridiculed you, Reverend? Do you think I should have been flattered by the term Reverend Dr. Chicken Leg? It was chicken wing, to be more precise. Perhaps you'd be more flattered if I'd said called you the Lord. The movement would have been sufficient. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful how well we're getting along? I suppose it's time for a rematch. Oh, so there is an ego in there to bruise. You should feel fortunate that a rematch is possible. Oh, well, my friend, I'm prepared to inflict suffering. If you prepare to endure. <coughs> well, seems we're even, Reverend. It seems we are. Is that why you invited me here? Actually, I'm surprised you accepted the invitation. I want to talk to you my protection. What? Well, after this morning, I thought you could... You offer me protection. And how are you going to do that, sir? Are you going to hold mass, sit in, and pray? Or perhaps your non-violent action movement was going to frighten the Molotov cocktail throw. Any so Molotov much. cocktails that were thrown to your house thrown because of your movement, not mine, Malcolm. Yes, Reverend. My movement is flexible. It considers all options. It leaves nothing out. It doesn't ask. It doesn't beg. It takes. It's ready to pay the price for freedom. And those who don't want to pay the price, really don't want it. Don't set yourself up as an authority on freedom. Well, I wouldn't think of it, Reverend. Authorities are those who study so hard to be white. And if they do real good, they get to be called scholars. And if they speak for all Negroes, they get to be called authorities. I came here to offer you my help. If you don't want it, I Your can... help. Your help is killing me, doctor. Am I to be accused of that as well? Not accused. Indicted. This nonviolent movement of yours will be the death of us all. Nonviolence is the only chance we have, Malcolm, to appeal to the conscience of this country. <laughs> the conscience of this country. 
This country doesn't have a conscience. It has no morality, no sense of honor. Hell, Martin, this country doesn't even have a memory. It forgets what it doesn't want to remember. And what we won't let it forget, it lies about. The only time this country has a conscience is when you agree with it. It doesn't care about right or wrong. You agree with it, it agrees with you. It will call you a hero if you tell black people here to be nonviolent. But it will call you a coward and a liar and a traitor if you tell those same black people to stop dropping napalm on little brown babies in Vietnam. No, doctor. You think you can appeal to the country, a uh, conscience of a country like that? The Jews in Germany, Martin, they were nonviolent. They were nonviolent, clean to the gas ovens. You go ask the victims of some of those concentration camps if nonviolence got them their freedom. Meanwhile, I'm going to tend to the victims of the concentration camps here in America, only they're called New York City, or Detroit, or Philadelphia, or Chicago. No, doctor. If you're looking for a conscience, you got to look somewhere else. And any man that preaches nonviolent while he watches the man build gas ovens is helping to destroy his own people. And when black people won't fight back, it not only makes it easy for racists to kill us, makes it just a fire. Do you think I've contributed to that? Let's just say, any man that wants to kill me, any man that wants to kill any black man doesn't have to stop and think about the consequences of his actions. They don't stop and say, I wonder what the good doctor would do. Ain't know what you'll do. Nothing. Which is just about what you've accomplished. Nothing. Don't you tell me that we've accomplished nothing, Malcolm. That people get beaten for nothing. Do you really think it's easy for me to see our own people beaten? To sit there and risk the lives of my children? Do you really think I would risk my own life for nothing, Malcolm? I don't want to die. I don't want our people to die. I don't preach nonviolence because I like it. I preach it because it's right, and because I'm a man, and because I'm a child of God. You look all over these, see these streets, and you see neon signs that tell you where to go and what to do. But where I grew up, it was a different kind of sign. It didn't have neon lights, but if you were black, you had no trouble seeing it. Signs of separation. Signs that burn the word for colored only in the psyche of Negro children. Signs that degraded and humiliated the parents of those Negro children on a daily, constant, and continuing basis. When those signs came down, the spirit of black people went up. So don't you tell me nothing was accomplished. I was in the Montgomery church when the announcement was made that buses in Alabama would no longer be segregated. What was accomplished then was written on the faces of all those who had fought for so long to prove that you can take a stand by sitting down. No, Malcolm. The only ones that ever doubted that we'd accomplish anything were those who never had to get up to give their seat to a white person, or move to the back of a bus, or watch white patrons being served in the comfort of a public restaurant while being forced to take their food out to the cold or rain. Don't diminish what we've accomplished. And don't misunderstand what we will accomplish. You see, Malcolm, sometimes you need to ride the bus before you can drive it. But don't you think we're not planning to own the whole bus line one day? And Malcolm, don't ever mistake nonviolence for non-action. You do a disservice to those who have been beaten so that you may have the freedom to question their courage. I never question their courage. Just their judgment. I'm beginning to question mine for coming here. Well, I could be easily corrected. The same step that brought you here will lead you away. Well, on that, at least we can agree. Yes. Yes, we can. Rashad! Rashad! Bring the car around. Dr. King wishes to leave. It'll be my pleasure.
Have a pleasant trip home. I shall. Thanks for the lecture on unity. You're welcome. But before you go, you should know. My faith teaches me to never embarrass even my enemies. I'll let you beat me in arm wrestling that second time. And my faith teaches me to have mercy, especially on your enemies. I let you beat me the first time. It seemed the Christian thing to do. You forgot your lunch. It's not for me, it's a gift. Is this what you brought me for protection? Does it have some sort of magical powers? Or is the doll non-violent too? It's not for you, it's for your daughter. My family was watching television when the news bulletin about the bombing appeared. They were doing a film report on the damage to your home. You were standing on the front lawn holding one of your daughters. Otala. Yes. My daughter wondered if everything in the home had been destroyed. And when she learned that I was going to see you tonight, she thought Atala could use a friend. That is her favorite doll. She loves it very much. If it has any magical powers, I suppose it'd be because of that. What's her name? I don't know that she has one. I met your daughters. Yolanda. How old is she? Nine. A tall of six. She'll love this. Thank you, daughter. Thank you, Yolanda, for her. For both of us. Mark. You've been to the mountain top. If you have a moment, I'd like to share mine with you. It could be my gift to you. Well, that's an offer I could hardly refuse. The balcony? I want you to see what I see. From out there? Oh, what's the matter, Reverend? I've never been partial to heights. You afraid of high places? I didn't say I was afraid. I said I wasn't partial. <laughs> well, don't that be all. All your problems seem smaller up here, Martin, more manageable. Reverend, I know this ain't the country, but there are some things you can love besides the land. Like the people that live on it. Yes, Martin, the people. If you had to do it all over again, what you, would you do it again? Again? I didn't want to do it the first time. I wanted to be the church, not a movement. But then one day a woman took a bus ride. It's amazing what you do when your feet get tired. You know what I wanted to be? A lawyer. For the prosecution or defense? It didn't matter. Either way, I'd have been held in contempt. <laughs> Yes, it doesn't matter what they call you, just what you answer to. Isn't it ironic that you fought so hard to get white people not to hate us, and I fought to stop us from hating ourselves? And those same people that we try so hard to teach may kill us? Why do you really want to see me, Malcolm? I don't know. I guess to see if you'd come. Another test? No. Another chance. Another chance. Did you really come here to offer me protection? Maybe I should have said comfort. The type of comfort that one man can give to another. You think we'll be remembering this man and only man? Nah. We cannot afford to let them know that that's all that we are. At least 
stuff for a while. You ever wonder what kind of men we would be if we were born in a different time? When race didn't matter and injustice is just part of a history lesson? I imagine we would have been quite dull. We'd have grown quite old. The dull have a way of outliving the rest of us. Perhaps that's their greatest punishment. Punishment. My father was murdered because he was outspoken. My mother was institutionalized because of a pain deep inside of her that drowned out the language of the world. I have nothing to leave my family. No money. Now, not even a home. Yet I can't help but wonder if there was more I could have done, more of myself that I could have given. You know, my father used to tell me the story about a young Baptist minister that went so north to seek his fame and fortune. After he'd become very successful, the pastor of his old Southern Baptist church had extended an offer of invitation for him to return home for a visit and to preach for his old congregation. Now the young minister could hardly refuse such an offer. In fact, he was rather proud at the thought of coming back to show the folk how successful he'd become. He decided to bring his seven-year-old son to teach him about his history, his roots. When the young minister had returned to his old church, he was moved so much that he proceeded to give one of the best sermons of his life. He had the congregation rolling from one emotion to the other. When everything was all over, the pastor went up to the young minister and said, John, why that truly was a moving and inspirational sermon. I wish we could give you some kind of honorarium, but as you know, our church isn't doing so well right now. <laughs> John waved him off, said it was fine. It was payment enough to simply return home for a visit. As John was leaving the church, he passed a church collection box and stopped and pulled out a crisp new $10 bill and placed it inside the box. He and his son then proceeded to the parking lot. As they were getting in their car, all of a sudden the pastor came running out of the church calling John's name. When he had caught up to him, he said, John, I know you don't want any type of payment, but we just couldn't let you leave without giving you a token of our appreciation. The pastor pulled out a crisp new $10 bill in which John immediately recognized the one he placed in the collection box just moments before. John took the money, exchanged his final farewells with the pastor, and got into the car. A moment or two later, John looked at his son, smiling proudly and confidently. He said, son, I hope this teaches you a lesson. His son smiled back and said, yes, dad, it has. If you would have given more, you would have gotten more. <laughs> We've all got to give more, Malcolm. More than we thought we needed to. And even then, sometimes it still may not be enough. We both may give our lives for this thing we call freedom. You know that, don't you? Well, it's funny. I would just imagine what Coretta might say, think if she knew we spent the night arm wrestling up here. <laughs> I imagine Betty would go in there early and late, but if she did. What did she do? Oh, you know babies, Martin. They come when they come, whether you're ready or not. <laughs> Martin, can you keep a secret? Who, me? <laughs> I'm hoping for a boy this time. And a little child shall lead them. And the lion shall dwell with the lamb. Okay, what are you doing? I suppose we should declare a winner. Oh. I suppose we shall. If there can be a truce, I guess there ought to be a winner. You want to? I want up how I want to. <laughs> <coughs> oh, 
All right, don't take advantage of me, Reverend. Remember, I'm older. The public, for some reason, continues to think of you as a young. They associate militancy with youthfulness, which is odd because that's a rather old idea. The best ideas are. You know, if whoever wins in here, doesn't mean necessarily going to win out there. If I knew that, I would have invited you a long time ago. Watch out, Reverend. The old man is taking charge. He did not leave me here to turn me around now. Quote scripture. Won't help you. Oh, but he can't hurt. <laughs> you should fight this hard when one of those sheriffs try to put a knot upside your head. You think it's so easy, you should give it a try sometime. How long are we going to let this continue? What? How long? Not long. How long? I'm going to call the draw if you are. <laughs> okay, you stop first. I'm from the country, Malcolm, but give me some credit. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll count to three, agree? You doing all the counting? <laughs> we'll alternate, is that big with your approval? I was taught that three is an odd number. <laughs> okay, I'll go first, and you go second, and we'll stop them. I'll do it. Agree? Agree. One. I said one. <laughs> Two. Two. Three. Three. <laughs> Imagine what we have accomplished that we join hands and pushed in the same direction. Martin, do you respect me? I will always be against violence, regardless of the cause, Malcolm. I asked if you respected me, and you speak of violence. Is that all you see? You don't need to ask me that, Malcolm. When you walk out into those streets, the eyes of the dead come to life in your presence. They see you and they believe in you. And because of that, they begin to believe in themselves. They respect you, Melvin. And yes, I respect you. You would have made one fine Baptist preacher. I wish my father had been alive to hear that. I suppose we won't be seeing much of each other. I imagine we will. Malcolm, is everything all right? We've been waiting for Dr. King. I should let you know it's getting late. Yes, it is. Rashad, will you help Dr. King with this coat? No, it's fine. I can manage. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, let me help you with that. Thank you. Rashad will see you downstairs, and I have a driver there that will take you where you need to go. I appreciate that. We would have made quite a team. We do make quite a team, Malcolm. Most persons just haven't realized it yet. May they remain ignorant a little while longer. Amen to that. <laughs> All praise to Allah. Malcolm, do you want more time together to exchange prayers with your friend? We don't need to be together to exchange prayers, especially with a friend. Where do you go, sir? I never meant to hurt you with anything I said publicly. It's important to me that you know that. It's important to me that you told me. Martin, if you're around longer than me, would you tell them we climbed one mountain together? And we saw the promised land. Yes. Tell them all. Take care of yourself, Malcolm. Malcolm, is there anything I can do? Goodbye, Martin. Goodbye. Allah, 
protect the draper. You don't know what love is until you've learned the meaning of the blues. Until you've loved the love you've had to lose. You don't know what love is. Thank mm -hmm. you.